Good morning. Good morning, everybody. We're about to about to get the meeting to begin. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning. I'd like to uh, open this meeting of a Sport and Recreation Committee on the 30th of May. Welcome to the Youth Councillor, Josephine Ripley. And I remind you that this committee, like previous, is live streamed. And I remind you, we haven't got too much on the agenda, but you can never tell how long or short. I've, I've stopped trying to guess or uh, predict those, but we will try and keep to a, um, a time with what would like to be finished by midday. We have one apologies from Councillor McGurk, who's away at an LGNZ symposium. Can I have someone accept the apology for Councillor McGurk? Thank you, Councillor Fulton, and seconder, Councillor Walker. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. So we have no public forum that I'm aware of, and the decisions of it, I should say the business will be as, as referred to the agenda. I don't see any change. We'll need to change on that. And please remember to raise any conflicts you may have at any stage. So first, first up on our order of minutes is the confirmation of minutes from the meeting on the 4th of April, which is on pages 13 to 16. Sorry, 7 to 12. Can someone uh, sit, put that receive, receive those? Thank you. Confirm that they are all correct. Any changes? Councillor Barker? Very good. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. So we've got now a recommendation of, oh, we've done that, recommendation of minutes of the 9th. Sorry, recommendation of the 9th, 9th of May as well. Sorry, so that's pages 13 and 16. Can I ask that we um, motion to receive those, that accept those? Can I have a second? Which is... Uh, well, that, that was that was discussed, passed, voted and passed at the time, unless there's something. Can the minutes be received? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Courtney. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. So we've got now a status report, pages 17 to 18. 19. Ask that we receive the stage report. Can I have someone? Thank you, Councillor Walker. Those in favour? I should say any of the sorry, sorry, I'll say that. Any of the, sorry, a bit of discussion on those. So pages 17, 18. I'll go through those. I'll go fairly slowly. So we've got um, reserve management plan. No, I'm, I'm keen, keenly um, interested in, in seeing what happens there, um, especially for months forward. I was here, thank you. Um, Mr Chair, the Sports Ground Reserve Management Plan has been drafted. However, in the drafting, it was identified that there were questions around the legalities of status of land for a number of parcels, and it was seen as being critical that those were identified, worked through, and put forward to you correctly before um, the reserve management plan was put forward to you. 
uh, it has been, it, it was ready at an earlier stage and then was overtaken by other more important governance works. So as it says, it will be coming to your next meeting. Thank you. Next is the Nelson Marina strategy. Yes, I have a question there, just to, yes. out of interest. Um, I'm delighted to see here that the uh, Nelson Marine strategy is going to be workshopped, and I just wondered when that was going to be, because uh, it seems as though they're now, now they've formed this uh, group that they certainly are moving forward. So could I hear from the officers as to when that workshop is going to be going to take place? Mr Chair, I regret, but Councillor Courtney is reading the resolution from March 2016, and that workshop was held some time ago. The um, outstanding matters are the column right over on the right, which shows that the Marina Advisory Group is working through matters, and that's where the resolution from Council continues to be actioned. So yeah, I have a, have a question as well. With the working group, which have... Um got underway and, we, and with the annual plan we've passed some I think some very good measures there especially with the boat ramp etc. Um, how are they, how are the working group going and when do they report to um, us? Mr Chair I think there was an update recently in the annual plan deliberations. Um, the feedback from the advisory group through the officer Mr Petherham who is working with that is that they are making great strides. That's why council resolved to include some funding in next year's annual plan. And I think for anyone to say more about it at this stage would be difficult because Mr. Petherham is the officer who's been working with that group. No, and I'll congratulate what's been achieved there. I thought that was really well received, what we did pass, especially for the boat ramp, etc., and uh, the improvement of health and safety in that area, and especially extreme increase in usage, especially over the summertime. Can I come back? Court, um, you know, I respect what the Chief Executive has said, but I'm on the Community Services Committee, and I, I just. Um, you know, um, I'm not aware of uh, citing that coming back to us. Um, but anyway, um, if you could enlighten me when that came back to the Community Services Committee, that report. Um, Mr Chair, the, um, that, that resolution relates from March 2016. Yes, so it will have come back in the last term and the resolution has been given effect to, um, and it will now come back to this committee because the structure of the council's governing committees has changed since that resolution was passed. So the one I'm referring to came back in the term of the last council, is that the point? Yes, thank you for that. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. I just had a, um, something to say on the last item. Oh, my God. Um, I'm, I'm just listening to the questions and the responses, and I am, um, Mr. Chair. First thing I suggest is that you meet, um, you catch up with the Marine Advisory Group, and the second thing I'd recommend is that somehow this committee gets a briefing because um, I want to think it's important that this term of council, the council who is here now, goes on the journey around the marina strategy and really I think it's up to you as chair to make sure that that happens. Thank you. No point taken. Yes, I would very much appreciate that. I think it's an excellent idea, Mr Chairman. Yes, no, I'm very keenly keenly aware of, well not aware, but keenly aware that I'm ex very interested to see what happens from that point and um, especially for going forward because that's been an area that's been heavy on my mind uh, that we need to make some, some goals, some changes certainly and surely. Any more discussion on the marina? No, we'll move over to the next page 19. Anything on page 19? Yes, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Just, just again a question about um, where things are. It's, it's wonderful to see the Trafalgar Centre the way it is now and it's looking great. There's a few things outside still to be done but I'm sure they'll be completed soon and it'll be, it'll be doing exactly what we hope that it will do in such a wonderful way. Um, in terms of fees and charges, we saw fees and charges as, as in the report here in the, in the second clause of that resolution, um, and that was back effective from 1 July 2016, but you'll see further down, it'll be noted that the charging regime for the Trafalgar Centre will be brought to a future committee meeting. Now, I might be wrong, but I can't remember. I was keenly interested to see what that regime was going to look like and what the charges were. Has it been brought back to the committee? Yes, we, we 
a little while back now, uh, a few months ago, we, we decided on the charges, and there were some new some new charges, especially because we've got the northern end, so it's a mm. different sort of usage situation, and we had some full day and half day charges right. set there. Oh, good. Well, I'll so go we're passed, and accepted and passed. But I do have a, a question of, of staff, or CM over an answer. All those charges, I'm wondering how they how they've bedded in, because I was it was new for us in those charges, and I agree with how they were comparatively set, but just seeing how those had bedded in, if we were comfortable or need to look at those in the future. And what the uptake, I guess what I'm saying is what the uptake, I've been very keen on this building being sweated well, and it has, I've been very impressed with the bookings and the usage. The northern end of the building is a bit of a um, learning curve for us. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. I think the um, the charges uh, were, were were we looked at comparable um, venues across uh, the, uh, um, the top to south and, and further, and and the, the charges are comparable with other other venues. Uh, uptake seems to be reasonably good. We've had a number of events through there. I think uh, we just need to um, uh, ensure that community use of the um, of the centre. Um, is maintained um, alongside commercial use, and, 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 and that's something we'll, we just need to look at the charging differential there for community use. Thanks. So you're saying with the community, we got bills of two two rates: of community and the commercial. You're saying that we may need to make some. Um, I, think you, I think there are different types of community use. There are community community users that are charge events, and they generally don't have any issues with the the charges that are mm. that are levied. Um, there are some community groups who would who would want to use it for non-charge events, and that's where the the cost may be an issue for them. So, do we have? Because I saw we had um, we had some costs, and they were set fairly, but for some groups they could be quite high. So, we're saying there is an enabling of us to have a very minimal charge for a particular community events. So staff are guided by the um, uh, the financial pol relevant financial policies um, in, ter in terms of trying to generate the, the income from the uh, the Trafalgar Centre, and and I, I guess we just need to be careful in getting the balance right between different types of community use. Um, there shouldn't be an expectation that that it's free to be used, um, but for non-charge events, then uh, we just need to make sure that there, we're not losing community use. When, when, there, when there's no other use of the, um, the venue. Thank you. Madam Mayor. No, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just, um, on this issue, I think it is important to recognise that we're in the, you know, the first 12 months of the Trafalgar Centre's um, reopening. And as part of that process, we were keen to build audience and exposure um, to encourage people to use the centre. And I just would hope that the officers are being mindful. I know I understand we've got a, a charging regime, but um, I always think that some events leverage other events, and we need just to be um, some degree of flexibility around that, particularly in this first 12 months. We had looked at setting aside a budget for events over that, over that period for an opening, and our decision was that we wouldn't go for a um, a full um, bells and whistles um, um, performance events um, gala opening. We'd go for a family event that would allow us to then spread some of the um, opportunity for a year-long opening event really to encourage, um, encourage uptake and understanding of the capacity and um, attributes of the Trafalgar Centre, which have proven to be um, actually better than imagined when it comes to the acoustic quality of the venue. So I'm just hoping I, I, there's a little bit of chat I can see at the moment about some events that are coming and um, some desire for some support um, because the costs are not small um, and I just want to make sure that we remember who ambas future, our future ambassadors are and we make sure that we do provide opportunities for them to sell the story about the Trafalgar Centre. Thank you. So. Um so, Mr. Ward, what have we got there? So, as Madam Mayor was saying, with 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 the commercial and the community, to get a good usage of that building for, say, family events, uh, and I may not have quite picked up on your answer before. You're saying there is some position for us to offer, say, the northern building at a a non-rate, very minimal rate, if we think it's in fitting with. So, so all I'm saying is that we will um, we will keep the usage under review. And when we come to look at the fees and charges for the following years, that we'll, we'll take that into account. Okay. The, any demand there? Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, Councillor, Councillor Rutledge and then Councillor Courtney. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, through you, Chris, do we uh, know what it costs to open the doors and turn the lights on there? Like what, what uh, basic costs of, of opening and having the building occupied for a day are? Um, so uh, I don't have those figures um, off the top of my head. What I would say is that we're currently looking at um, the, the contract for our venues, and once that has gone gone through, we'll have a better, a clearer picture moving forward of what the costs are. Yeah. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chairman, can Officer Ward tell us about the advertising, the promotion of the centre? You've ramped it up, no doubt, and um, you know what are you doing in that regard? Uh, so that's correct. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, Council appointed a venue, uh, venue marketing officer uh, last year. Uh, one of her prime uh, focuses has been on the Trafalgar Centre, um, both on the pre-launch uh, comms and, and media. And she was going around a number of the trade shows prior to the opening of the, of the centre um, and continues to work closely with our, our colleagues over in the Nelson Regional Development Agency who are um, promoting conference conference uh, use of our venues, um, our venue marketing officer is looking at the, the to provide a complimentary service to, to that and looking at sport and, uh, and performing arts. I think I'd just like to, uh, similar to my statement to the last Chairman's report there, our last committee meeting, I was, I've been very impressed by the feedback by uh, event managers and um, those who provide the services there on, on how good it's been, especially for concerts, <laughs> etc. And um, the feedback has been very positive. And I think it's an area we need to um, get the community behind, which I'm sure they are, but get them to at least have a taste of the of the building early on, so that word of mouth can be spread. Councillor Barker. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just following on on this topic, um, I think it's very important that we do strike that right balance, because I look at um, at another venue, the Theatre Royal, which has a hundred percent booking. They tell us, but it uh, it runs at a loss. And that's because they're, they're having so many community groups and maybe taking preference, I don't know, but there is a standing cost every time the thing is used. And if you, if you give it away free, you, you run into the situation where they, what they have at the Theatre Royal. That can't make, it doesn't make a profit, and yet it's being used virtually, um, we're told, most of the time. So it's, that balance has got to be very careful. If we, if we got a, an income attractive booking, that's the one that should take preference. Moving on down the status report, we've got uh, the next one there is the golf, the golf course, but that is already in, well, part of that is already in this report. No questions there. So that's page 19. That's the end of the status report. Can I someone? Sorry? Yes. I has? Oh, very good. That makes it. Uh, yeah. So, on to the next, the next item for state. Sorry, okay. My fault there. Um, can we put that? Those in favour? Those against? Carried. Right, moving on to the next item. Um, what I've been keenly waiting to see is the Brook Valley Holiday Park opening review. Sorry. No, fair enough. I'll. Um, I will insert the chairperson's report here. Um, there's nothing, nothing official there, but I would like to take the opportunity to. Uh, I'd like to think it's a sport and rec, a sport and rec opportunity there. But the the book fair, we've got the founders book fair coming up this Saturday, and um, that's a great, a great venue. But it's a great event which raises. You've got over a hundred thousand books there, and um, they make a great. It's been a great success each year. So much so that I've turned it into a bit of a sporting event. Me and um. And, and uh, Alistair Cotterill will uh, have a race every year for the last seven years to see if you can get first through the door. So that's how I've snuck in as a sport and rec event. But I would like to promote that. It's great for families and a great turnout. So it's 10 o'clock, doors opening. Or well, if you line up at 7 o'clock, you've got a chance to get to the first books. <laughs> I'll move straight on to the news. Uh, just wanting to know, is it possible to still take books down there? I've just, uh, in the last weekend, a big tidy up of my bookcases. So I've got a few spares. They're, they're they always... Take the they take them now? They're always taking books. They're always taking books. Back to the um, Brook Valley Holiday Park review. So we've got this. This has come up. And this, which I'm very glad to see, is going to the commercial commercial committee, subcommittee, to, to review it and go over that. 
to see how we step forward from a, a commercial perspective and see how the camps are operating and how we should go from there. So I'm keenly waiting to see how that goes and that will come back to the Sport and Rec. But there's some discussion there on what is going to the subcommittee. So I'm quite open for some discussion and questions, but I'll, um, I'll let the st staff member produce this. Thank you. Sorry. They're not going? Light on. Go on. We've got that right now. <laughs> uh, until uh, from 16th December until 31st of March 2017. Uh, and the recommendation is the this report uh, runs in line with uh, the campground review, which will be followed up further through by Chris Ward. Thank you. Is there anything in the report you think we should be? Um, I'll take report as read. Is there anything you think we should take into consideration there? Uh, no. As a committee no, today, no. Councillor Fulton. Yeah, I've got a question around the security and um, why was the security so high? It seems like phenomenal that there was 24-7 security for that period of time. I think at the time when you opened the camp was uh, probably one week prior to Christmas and you probably at that time there it was, pr it was pretty hard to determine how much security we, we involved there at that time. So security stayed on pretty much from full time over the, over the New Year period and then we sort of scaled that off until the end of January. So by the end of January, we, we sort of felt at that point we probably didn't need them so much, but we, we, we didn't know at that time. But, so I, I'm just confused, like, how, how is the decision made that to have security uh, overnight from 7pm till 7am in the morning for a month seems to me to be a very, it's a very small campground and I would have thought security checking between the hours of 7 and 10 p.m. and then, you know, like, I, I'm surprised that there needs to be someone there for 12 hours. Uh, sorry, through Chair. Um, at that, because we've only got one person actually who lives at the camp, their security was probably paramount to us, um, and we couldn't determine what was going to happen over that period. We didn't know how many people were going to turn up. So we went probably for worst case scenario, uh, for there could have been a lot of people turning up at that time, so that's why we had security for that, for that period. Does that answer that question? Sorry. Chair. Mr Chair, I believe that at the time the Council considered the reopening of the camp, Council was advised that there would likely be quite a, quite a cost to security because of exactly the matter of not being certain about how many people would turn up and the interface between those who were tourists and campers wanting to use the facilities and those who are there year round uh, and the advice was given that we felt that would be a prudent thing to do from a health and safety perspective. So we put we did put some budget aside mm -hmm. when we when we first passed it to cover those potentials. Um, that we fitted within that budget, did we find that was covered what came up or did we did we over or underestimate what we uh, through this year. So you're referring to some of the um, the so. items of the what we're doing for the. We well, know for when we open, we, I think we put 30. I think if I correctly, we put 38k aside for the opening for what we need, and I realise the security, etc. And was that? Um, I assume that was sufficient. We didn't come into difficulties from that. Uh, yes, it was certainly sufficient. Yep. So we didn't spend. We probably spent um, probably 70, 17 to 20 of that Brilliant. 38. Very good. So it was prudent. It was prudent, I believe, what we put aside there. And there's always an unknown element there. And and it did surprise me the security initially. But I see, like you say, over Christmas time, New Year, you're not sure what can happen up, how well or badly received the places, and who's going to. And the might I've had those issues in years gone by, and have changed your structure somewhat to suit. Um, but but from that on, we found after I believe is that correct? After that holiday period, well not holiday period, the Christmas period, then it wasn't an issue and the staff were quite capable. Just on, on, the, on that, 
I'm sorry, Kate, I'll let Kate follow up. Well, I guess I just think that in terms of costing, there could have been, I think that health and safety is really important and I think security is important, but I think that having a security person at the gate, I mean, I went up there walking during that period of time and it was, it was a pretty big surprise to see someone standing at the gate as you go in. I don't think any of the dock campgrounds have that. They are highly used. I don't, I've never really experienced that kind of security guard at the gate as you go into a campground and I was quite surprised by that. I think it's a very small campground and I think that possibly employing two staff members who have the ability to work, work on the camp and work on the maintenance and, and take care of things as well as be security would have been a better approach. I think that finding, I understand. finding ways Councillor, to do security better. Councillor Ford, I understand what you're, you're saying. There's a commentary happening there and, and I, is there a question? Is a question? Well, my question would be to the officers: Can you can you review how you do security in terms of um, uh, caretaking for the campground as well? I would have thought that the two two roles could go hand in hand. Um, Mr. Chair, at the time the council considered the reopening, it was given clear advice about security, and it was also given clear advice about the short-term nature, or, or the short amount of notice that allowed us to get the optimum outcome. So we were coming from behind, so to speak, um, taking the most prudent steps we could within the time frame we had available. Appreciate that, just into the future, it would be great to review. We were prudent in our Start it was a fairly rapid start up at the time, and I realised we've got a, a full time staff member. Is that correct? So we, we operated on one, we had contractors come through, I understand, for the upkeep and cleaning of the facility, and we had just we had the one full time, was it one and a half full time staff members managing the camp? Was that correct? Uh, through the chair, yeah, that, that is correct. So we had uh, one full time staff member who lives on site, but we also had to. Um, a contractor from uh, Nelmec to help out that part time through that period, and he's still um, does part time work there at the moment. Well, just just to follow on that, for we've got one for and, uh, and and much as will come through from the subcommittee. And in the past, was run privately. Obviously, when it privately and, and, and run by the council, it can be quite a bit of a different a different beast to put it in way. Um, one and a half staff members to run that that would be more than adequate if we're looking into the future. Um, my concern, it may not be founded, was that we had a manager at the camp, but then another another employee or, or, or contracted out for the cleaning and maintenance. Would that not be, have been done by the... Mr Chair, where's the governance issue here? Well, for me, it's just a question of how this is what we've learnt from, from this last few months, because this is carrying on through to the subcommittee and help shape, shape that in any questions that they may have coming back. But it's good to have a bit of feedback from how we've had over the last three months on the running of the camp. Um, we'll take that into consideration and in how we manage the operation of it going forward. Any other questions? Councillor Barker? Yeah, Mr Chairman, I, I um, am looking at the figures that I've got here and I want to know when this goes to the commercial subcommittee, I would like it to have details of the projected end of year figures. Because looking at the moment, we've got an income of fifteen thousand. We've got we've been given security expenses. I'd like to know the full cost of opex operational expenditure and what it's likely to be by the end of this financial year. Because it's looking like it's going to be quite unfavourable. So um, if we can have those details projected to the end of uh, June, going to the commercial subcommittee, we'll be able to have a really good look at it when it gets there. Thank you, Councillor Barker. There were some figures. Um, one of the one of the councillors requested that, and I have a copy of that, and that may be something we can can look at. Thank you. Anyone else, Councillor Courtney? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to Officer Allsop. First of all, thank you for your report. I, I thought it was a very fair and balanced report. I felt comfortable reading it. I really did. It was uh, optimistic, and uh, it, it was pleasant. A pleasant result after three months. I had doubts about the length of duration of the you know, time or the amount of time we allowed before we examined this and you brought down your report. But it's, um, 
it is a pleasing result for the first three months. I do notice here that um, permanent residents have dropped from the last report from 29 down to 19. Is there a reason for that, the drop there? No, it's just natural attrition, right? Is that right? Drop by a third. <coughs> yeah, that's right. And I want to add, uh, continue on from Councillor Fulton there because um, there has been some residents contact me, rate pars, feeling that the security at the camp was, to use their words, excessive over the holiday period. So you'll be revisiting that as you bid this project down. But through the chair, the, um, uh, the chief executive has already given that commitment that we will do exactly that. And um, so I think that's about, yes, I think that's about all. Thank you. Good. Any more questions on that? Madam Mayor. No, I thank you through you, Mr. Chair, to the officers. Um, I just want to follow up this issue around the financials. Obviously, that's a matter that um, we should be looking at, this committee. And I understand that the officers have said in the summary document here that they um, believe there is, uh, in terms of financial impact, that the, the remaining open and short term will have minimal impact on the current budget. So obviously some members of the committee have more information than I do in relation to the financial position. I always find that a little bit tricky in a meeting and would always prefer that the, that's, those, that sort of information is tabled if it's available so we can all see it. Um, I'm just coming back to the issue, so I'm interested in, in what sort of impact it's going to have. It's saying it's minimal. Um, I'm noting that Mr Alsop has answered to us that the NELMAC and noted in the report that the NELMAC cleaning services are remaining. Is that because there is increased use that is, is being sustained now? Because I, as from what I read in the report, um, at 4.13, Nelson cleaning services are engaged to manage the extra cleaning and does that, do I take it from that that there is sufficient usage now to I mean there is a necessity still for extra cleaning? So am I seeing increased usage or am I just seeing an increased level of service from what was there previously? So two questions around the level of service usage and the second one is about the financial position in terms of the budgets. When we say minimal, what do we mean by that? I just don't want to find that we get have unbudgeted expenditure issues for this particular activity six months into it. So would that be right to add what we perceive or what is happening now? We're going into a so-called quieter months, where we've where we've got a, a, a expecting a, a fair patronage there, or not? Uh, through the chair, the, the cleaning services remain, and they always have done through the weekends. Considering we've only got one person who who maintains that camp during the week, we always have a cleaning service that will do the weekends on that behalf to make up. Um, we increase the cleaning services as times we use the cabins um, and we get them in to do that and also probably an extra clean during the day. I would suggest that probably at this point here that those cleaning services will be reduced during this winter period. Sorry, I'm, not, I'm still not clear, Mr Chair, so if I could just ask again through you to Mr Allsop. Did we increase the cleaning services? So, so I'm taking it before we said go reopen the camp, you know, we did it last minute to deal with our freedom, uh, try and assist with our freedom camping issue, that we didn't have NELMAC doing cleaning? Or what are you saying to us is that we had them, we increased their level of service during that period, it's now dropped back, back to what it was previously, just so the budgets are basically this, back to normal. Is that, is that the scenario? Through the year, that's correct. All right, so so this, this year's budgets, so just in terms of this year's budgets, um, the, the commentary here in the summary on decision making is that the impact of remaining open in the short term will have minimal impact on the current budgets. What, what do we mean by minimal impact? Mr Chair, tens, can... fives of fives, tens. Um, Council had already allocated $38,000 of unbudgeted operational expenditure. That's referred to in paragraph 4.16. The reference in the important considerations for decision making takes that $38,000 into account and says that the cost of, re of it remaining open after the 31st of March will have min minimal impact on the budget. Bits need to be read together basically. The 38000 from Council's decision in December and the continuing, continued open availability of the camp having limited financial impact for the remainder of this year.
Thank you. Councillor Walker. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Where I come from is a situation where I don't feel comfortable that when we come to the new season that we may be looking back on the expenditure of the camp, which may not have been um, properly managed to the extent that I'm just worried that we're going to be f confronted with a relatively high cost over this trial period, and I'm not sure that I've got complete confidence that we've been uh, adaptable enough to the circumstances that we've been confronted with. So I'm just concerned that um, we don't have costs in here that we are facing later on um, and that it negatively impacts on how we view the camp because it is a really nice little camp and I'd hate to see it closed again. So what I'm understanding from Council Walker, you're saying that the, the, the costs that we've run at the moment may be reflected in what we think the costs should be in the future, which are incorrect, is that in a nutshell? I'm just concerned that um, we, when we come to review it for the incoming season, that we've got sufficient um, uh, records of exactly what costs have been. We know that the security is deemed to be perhaps greater than needed, so we're going to review that, which is good. I just wouldn't want it to negatively impact on how we view it at the, prior to the coming season. Thank you. Yeah, no, and I hope the sub-commercial committee will, will take that into consideration. Councillor Butt Rutledge and then Councillor uh, Fulton. Th thank you, uh, Mr Chair. A couple of, couple of questions. Um, Semi-permanent, can you give me a definition of what that is uh, and, and how that's actually playing out? Through the chair, how do you refer as playing out? P playing out. Yeah, playing out. So, so what the what the definition of semi permanent is, and then how it's actually um, happening at the Brook Camp. Uh, through the chair, uh, semi. Mr. Ward's got a cover. Bit of a tag team going on there, but this is, some of this has been through quite a discussion. But I understand your question. A lot of it's been through discussion and iterations leading up to the decisions we made. Um, so I'm, I'm a wee bit conscious that we're not getting into too much of a detail of running the camp. Um, we've, we've been doing it over, over the summer months and it's going to the subcommittee, um, but I do ask it to be noted. And Mr Ward. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. <coughs> there, there's been, uh, I think the, uh, the, the Brook Reserve Management Plan sets out quite clearly our approach to, to camping and to the, the issue of semi-permanence in the, in the area and also the long-term uh, requirements in terms of the comprehensive development pl plan that would establish uh, a site for a permanent residence in a, uh, that would meet with uh, that would be compliant with the regulations. So th th there is a full discussion through the reserve management plan. I'm happy to take Councillor okay. Rutledge through that. Okay, that's fine. Um, the second thing then, is, so so you're you're happy that the Brook Camp is operating within the the general guidelines that we've set out there. Through the GS. Oh, good. Um, with, with regards to the cost, so I just did a, and I appreciate it's a bit of a bit of hack job maths, but if you take the thirty-eight thousand that we've budgeted and split it by the number of people we've had there, um, we're talking about a subsidy of fifty-seven dollars per person per night. Oh, uh, in your opinion, does what we we're doing here actually stack up as as good value for? Uh, the rate payer and achieving a good outcome for Nelson. I don't, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I don't believe that elected members can ask officers for their opinion. Um, we give advice. Okay. The, the advice it's would this stack up from a commercial point of view? If this was operating as a commercial entity, would this stack up? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that's self evident. Uh, and I think the council resolved to open the ground for reasons other than commercial factors. And I think we've got to keep in mind, and I'm fully conscious of that, uh, the scenario we opened had been closed for a while, and we weren't too sure how, especially with the influx, potential and actual influx of freedom campers, how well it was going to be up to taken with that. So we we could say over-engineered it, but you you got to take that into account because the, the especially after the Kaikoura. Etc. Um, 
it was reasonably well utilised, but I felt that it was let down that we weren't able to promote it as well as we could have, but that was of no fault of the council. That was just in, in how it had to be opened up very quickly, and it's when you're restarting something past, especially after two or three year lag time, it's always difficult to get the word back out there. So I feel that the period of time it had open over the Christmas period is sort of a bit of a bad, a, an unfortunate reflection of what it could be doing in the future. Um, the ru running costs are going to be high, and we were never looking, I don't think, looking at it, running at a profit over that Christmas time. Um, but with the feedback from the subcommittee that will hopefully give us a bit of direction on what expectations and how to fine tune that for the whatever decision is made from there on. Would that be a, Chris, would that be fair to say or any commentary on that? I think staff have gave fairly consistent advice that the, the long term running of the camp by council is probably not the best uh, best way to to run. We have um, and I think I do believe that the commercial subcommittee will, will give us some strong guidance in terms of uh, the best model moving forward. <coughs> Thank you. Councillor Mafson. Sorry, Councillor Mafson and Councillor Fulton. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. I'm not a member of this committee, so thank you for the opportunity. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, one comment is uh, the situation over that period wasn't helped by the fact that we were doing roadworks at that particular point and we had a sign up that said road closed. So anyone who casually wanted to go to the camp would have done a U-turn and gone home. Um, those things we've got to be conscious of. But secondly, um, I know that uh, all going well, Kaikoura will be open uh, this Christmas, but if it's not, we have to prepare ourselves to make better use of both the Mai Tai and the Brook, as well as Tahuna. So I only hope, Mr Chair, that uh, a little bit of work's being done in that area now to prepare for uh, about the same number of freedom campers, uh, whether contained or not contained. And it's just raising a flag at this point so that we we don't lose sight of that, uh, that we'll have the similar impact that we had in the last season. Thank you. No questions there. Councillor Matheson? <laughs> Councillor Fulton? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Skinner. So I had some questions around um, the camping ground being open to freedom campers. So if you were freedom camping, were you not charged? How, how did that work? Uh, through the chair, no. Uh, all freedom campers were charged $10. Okay, so, so that could be partly why freedom... I was just curious to understand why freedom campers would have chosen to maybe go to Eccleston Street rather than, say, up to the Brook. So Eccleston Street was free, and whereas the Brook was a charge. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. And was it actively promoted through the eyesight as being a location for freedom camping at this rate? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So freedom campers still chose to go somewhere completely free. And, and my uh, second question was around security, going back to the security. So in terms of um, places where we uh, had freedom camping, so Montgomery, Buxton, Eccleston Street, was there 24-7 security at any of those places? Uh, through the chair, no. There were just regular visits throughout the night. So, so in theory that could have been happening up at the brook as well. That could have been part of a loop of a regular visit. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm conscious that we're really going back over decisions we'd made and separate decisions with the Freedom Camping and the campsite. I understand where you're, I think I understand where you're, where you're, where you're heading with that. But I... Well, I guess no, my question was around how much did the security no. cost for those places, and if and because I think in terms of that cost effectiveness, if if the security was doing a whole lot of camping grounds Camp as part of their route, could you be looking at security in terms of all locations around the? Well, city? Council Council Fulton, I, I don't think it's, it's for us to today um, to go into detail of. Uh, Mr. Chair, I wonder if I could remind all councillors that the Brook Camp has council staff mm. and my obligation to them around health and safety has a significant cost impact which does not exist at Ackerston Street. Okay. All right. So my, my commentary on that, and, and I don't want to spend much more time on this, at least if people have got some dire questions. This, and, and I hope and I trust and understand that the 
subcommittee will take all that into consideration. This is going to be a different beast when you're looking at its future of the camp and the best way forward from there. And from my perspective, it's, it's, it's probably not as council-run facility, but that's yet to wait to see what report comes back for that. And it was a period of time of just getting that open, taking on the, the tide of visitors over some period, and a reflection of the costs, I believe, will be quite different to what I should expect. For example, the, the management of the, the camp was taken on, a, on a, a fairly large, immediate task there, and a bit of fine tuning there. But I understand, I think, what you Councillor Fawley is talking about, looking at it as a whole for what we're doing for Freedom Camping for our paid campers. You'd like to see the subcommittee look at that and how it fits as a whole as far as running the camp. That would also, depending on the feedback we get from that, whether it becomes a still run as a council entity or if it's, if it's tendered off for a third party, so that would probably be out of our control in that sense. But I'm any question or question, I think, oh, Councillor, sorry, Madam Mayor, was that correct? I have no idea whether what you were saying was correct or not, Mr Chair. I'm not even sure it was relevant to the matter in front of us. So I would like to move the um, recommendation Thank on you. the report. That'd and that we receive the report and we refer it to the Commercial um, Committee. But what I would say in um, speaking to that is that I want this committee to be very mindful of the role of the Commercial Committee. And the Commercial Committee has a set of delegations that um, require it to have a look at um, operation of council's businesses. And this is, this is a service that is provided. I wasn't provided with a set of the detailed financials prior to this meeting. Fortunately, the Deputy Mayor has managed to show me some, I'd have to say, they make my eyes water. Uh, so I would just say when it goes to the Commercial Committee, um, please understand that there are some numbers in, in here that indicate, from what I've seen this morning, a, a substantial ratepayer contribution here. And I think the back of the envelope um, calculation by uh, Councillor Rutledge should cause you to pause thinking about what the subsidy was if that was about right and that was you said rough calcs um, over, the, over the period so I just want you to be conscious of the fact that do expect to get some feedback from the commercial committee around the real cost of this and what this is costing mm -hmm. the ratepayers and how it sits in the um, best use of the uh, of what's in the best interest of the people of Nelson and the best use and development of our assets. I would have to say, on the basis of the numbers I've seen this morning, I think it is highly unlikely that the Commercial Committee, without wanting to determine that, will have um, nothing to say. I'm sure they're going to have, the Committee will have something to say about how it moves forward. What it'll be is yet to be seen. Well, thank you, Madam, Madam Mayor, and that's why I think it's very important it does go to the Commercial Subcommittee that we get that interrogation, that oversight of that. Any discussion? Any Councillor Fulton? Anyone else? Um, yes, I support the recommendation. I think it's a really important aspect in terms of it going to the commercial subcommittee. I think that um, at this point in time, the role of the Brook Valley camp in terms of um, freedom camping is quite an important uh, issue to turn our minds to when you look at the uh, current proposed freedom camping bylaw in terms of the limits we're going to place on where, on where freedom campers will be able to go elsewhere through the city. So I can't remember what the numbers were at Ackerston Street over the summer, but I think they peaked at something like 143 or even more than that over the um, peak nights. And I guess when I heard from the public, they had big concerns about security there. So it seems like we, in some aspects we've got uh, we spent $17,500 on security up at the Brook over the summer, but perhaps not enough on security at our freedom camping sites. And so I think security is an important issue to look at in terms of how we look after our whole city, um, how we ensure that people who are coming into our town in that freedom camping mode are able to camp places safely and that we remain a welcoming city and we look at how we do subsidise that as ratepayers. Ideally, Obviously, central government would step in and support that kind of tourism because uh, you could have an arrival tax, which which meant that there was income supply. And a point of order, Mr. Chair. I think it is important that the members of the committee speak to the matter in front of them, and I don't believe that Councillor Fulton is speaking to the matter in front of her, which is a motion to move the Brook Camp matter to the commercial subcommittee. So, I'll ask you to rule on my point of order, please. 
order it held, I'd uphold. I'd ask Councillor Ford in the. I'll withdraw that, but I think that the role of the Brook Camp in terms of freedom camping it has, into the future it could have a big role to play, and so we need to consider that in, the, in that committee. So when, when it comes back from a subcommittee council forward, and that will be our chance to, to, I believe, comment on that, this is what's in front of us today is putting it to the subcommittee for them to, to overview that and come back to us to make those decisions. Any other speakers for or against what we've got in front of us today? Mr Chairman, I just want to repeat what I said a little earlier when I was questioning Officer Allsop, that I don't think it's reasonable to judge the performance of the Brook Valley Holiday Park on three months. I no. said that and I mean that. It's totally unreasonable and unfair. Um, so I want the uh, Commercial Committee and to take cognizance of that and mm. uh, I'm pleased like others that it's going there. About when you look at it, there were so many factors working against it, wasn't there? You know, the Deputy Mayor tells us that it's signs saying the road was closed. There was inadequate time to promote it and advertise it. And the list goes on, um, working against this. And uh, that's why I said at the, mo at the start that I thought it was a reasonable summation. It could have been a lot worse. Mm. It could have been, really and truly. And the subsidy, uh, as Councillor Rutledge points out, is, is quite horrendous. But you know, we would. I would like to have seen 12 months report or a six months report on this, not just three months, with all the other factors working against it. No, I'll speak. I'll briefly, I'll briefly comment and, and similar to Councillor Courtney. Um, um, it's prudent that we put it through a subcommittee, the commercial subcommittee. But I was also conscious, over, especially over the last few months, on some expenses, and there were some unknowns happening there, and without predetermining what, what's going to come back, I think it clearly shows that it's, it's not something for council to run, uh, privately run, it's quite a bit differently. And I, I was very noticeable of, and I think it hasn't done us much favour um, in the figures of usage and in, in the promotion of that, but we weren't in a position to promote it heavily for long term. It was a, a short period before we decided whether to tender or run. No more speakers for or against. I'll put those in favour. Those against. Carried. Moving on to our next document, which is the uh, Waiatakaro Golf Course feedback and proposed fee changes. Um, I ask that we ask that we receive that report. You move that we receive the report. Councillor Walker, seconded by Councillor Fulton. Thank you. Mr Ward. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I'll take the report as read and we'll just uh, note that there is a, a relevant matter on the status report in the public excluded um, section of this agenda as well. Any questions for Mr Ward? Some silence is quite good. Well, I don't want the um, rate powers and residents to think that we're kicking the can down the road on this. I, uh, I want to ask uh, Officer Ward that um, uh, although we're not doing anything at this point, um, and you've worked on it for two years, it's not uh, uh, wasted time I would suggest you're working in other directions. Um, I think we are, as through the chair, I think we are making progress on, on the issues that have been identified at, uh, at the golf course. Um, I think the, f the feedback we got from the community through this process has been useful and will inform future decisions um, around the golf course. Uh, and I'm confident that we, um, we will um, be managing the, co the course in, a, in a, a more effective manner moving forward. Councillor Rutledge. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, through you, one of the stated goals is, is around um, promotion of, of youth getting into golf. Um, the numbers that were presented in terms of the feedback, which I accept may not be representative of, of all players, didn't indicate anybody under 26, and that was quite a wide first band as well, was actually 
um, fed back into the process. Can you, uh, can you comment on, on efforts that are going into achieving that goal and, and or whether that's something that the, uh, whoever's running it into the future will turn their mind to? Um, through the chair, I think the the issue of uh, of, of uh, young players at the, the course. There have been various various initiatives over the past, but it's been fairly sporadic in terms of uh, of getting there. There is um, uh, some uh, in terms of looking after young people and the requirement, the legislative requirements. Are, um, we also just need to get right. But we have included in uh, in a draft contract moving forward um, some uh, community outcomes, including. Um, uh, provision of, of coaching and uh, for young people and the opportunities for young people who have never played golf before to p perhaps pick up a club at uh, no or, or very minimal cost. So is there is there anything in the efforts you've made so far that would suggest the charging regime is is proving a barrier to uh, to that participation or is there something different that could be done going forward? Um, through the chair, that's that's not something that's come through um, the, um, the the conversations that we've had. Although the, the but the club and staff acknowledge that we do want to get more young people uh, um, are using the course. Um, I think the way to go about it is probably to to look at providing a very uh, free or very minimal costs for for young people to to actually try the game. Um, and uh, both the club and and uh, council offers quite reasonable rates, disc heavily discounted rates for young players. Councillor Barker and then Councillor Matheson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's not so much a question at this stage, but more comments. That I found the survey results were very, very interesting, and it just they just backed up my view that we have an asset here, which is a wonderful municipal golf course which provides an excellent facility. It's interesting to see the survey results, who uses it. It's, it's, ma it's males, simply, in terms of the survey. No females, and they'll find that surprising with such a wonderful course. It's, um, and in terms of the value for money, when you take into account, I think I read, 50% um, felt the course offered good value for money, and 29% excellent value. So that's nearly 80% of people think they're getting, they're getting really good value out of our golf course. And I think that's great um, that, that we have such a, a beautiful golf course. It's a while since I've played it. I'm, this really entices me to get back into golf a little bit. But um, I, I'm happy with the, uh, with, the, with the way it's going in terms of the recommendation. I just want to reiterate what a wonderful asset we have. More people should use it. Maybe we should maybe we should market it much, much more. It's, it's something that uh, I know in the past visitors used to like to go to and would, and would rave about what a beautiful little course it was. Councillor Matheson. Thank you, Mr Chair. Can I just ask you, Mr Ward, um, through you, uh, Mr Chair, has any more discussion been, has any more discussion been held with the mountain bike people with regard to um, um, promoting the place together? Um, I, I think that, that so this, through the chair, there's been, there's been ongoing discussions with mountain bike people in terms of um, the location of a Mai Tai hub and how the, um, the golf course club rooms um, could be used. Um, and I think the, the, the thinking is that the, 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 the golf course itself isn't the ideal venue for a, for a mountain bike hub. There's, there's some conflict issues in there. But certainly for some of the social aspects, it may well be um, uh, to have club rooms that were, were more used by, by a broader section of the community. Certainly there's some, some merit in exploring that further. And I think both the, the golf club and the mountain bike people are, are keen to explore that further. Councillor Ward, you will keep front of mind, won't you, when you're considering this issue going forward, that this is a public golf course. I say that because um, I don't, and I don't want to use the word, I can't think of another one to use, I don't want it to become elitist, I don't want uh, the club to take over and uh, completely, and the public in general feel um, shut out. It's always had a reputation of being open, and I think it should remain that way, open to the people of Nelson and visitors, uh, and accessible to them. And I have some reservations about that. So, can you uh, help me with that? 
uh, certainly through the chair, the key to the onward sustainability of the club is, is course use, uh, whether that's by members of public, uh, visitors to, to Nelson in the region. And I, I agree with Councillor Barker's comments, it is a fantastic course for visitors to, to use. Um, or whether it's club members, uh, I think it's the, the where we're trying to get to is, is encouraging encouraging broadest po possible use, and it's certainly no um, no intention to make it elitist in any way. Where did the idea of the um, uh, the multi round card? system come from because that's where the greatest objection was to move this forward going from the uh, replacing the multi-month concession uh, system to the um, multi-round cards um, it seemed horrendous the cost the prices there where a superannuitant would pay it said I think somewhere in the uh, submissions three or four hundred dollars a year and they'd be forced to pay something under this new system that we're proposing multi-card system $1,500 a year. Is that correct? So through the chair, I think the, the, there were win the, with any system there are winners and losers. So different people, depending on the amount of time, the, uh, the, the number of courses, they, they, uh, rounds, I beg your pardon, number of rounds that they play and how frequently they play would, uh, would be affected one way or another in terms of a, a concession card uh, or a multi-round multi card. Um, some of the, the issues were, were covered in, pr in previous reports to, to Council, but the, the system that we had effectively was setting up some competition between club and, and the pro shop that was down at the course uh, in terms of uh, year-long concessions. Uh, and, and the multi-round concessions was one option to, uh, to change that system. But obviously the feedback that we've got um, is that, that that probably would impact um, people gr uh, um, more seriously than we we imagined previously. Just one final question, because there's so many questions involved in this, and I know Count uh, Officer Ward is still working on it, but there seems to be a need to have a representative from the the, the non-club players, if uh, if you get what I mean. Um, you know, you've got the club representing themselves well, and there just seems to be a need for some representative there, and I, I notice we have a staff member there as a contractor, but um, in what capacity have you used him or her? Um, there just needs to be a voice for them because they are quite a prominent part of this, aren't they, to get a resolution here? Uh, yes, through the chair, I'd, I'd agree with Councillor Courtney's uh, comments. Uh, it's always challenging to try and find a representative of a, of a group that is is not constituted and so it's a, it's a, it is a group of individuals um, but I think we need to work harder to try and um, uh, get their views to the table in terms of decisions that are made in the future. No other questions of Mr Ward? Madam Mayor. Uh, thank you through you Mr Chair. Uh, just coming back um, Mr Ward to Questions about marketing of the um, of the golf course, and the, is that something that is undertaken by the whoever holds the contract? So who does promote and market Wahi Takaro? So, so currently through the chair, it is uh, it's the council officer that holds the contract for. Uh, so it's, it's a council role. So you will have seen there's uh, there's advertising taking place at uh, Nelson Airport. Um, and there's also information that goes through the eyesight and through um, to, to visitors as well. Um, but it is something that we're looking at whether the, it should be part of the venue marketing officer and, and as, as a package of Nelson, that the Nelson as a whole has to offer. Uh, I'm just just follow up question to, um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Wood, don't, don't you think it's kind of integral though to the um, management of the course. So if I'm thinking about marketing opportunities around golf, a lot of it goes around tournament. So it's about a, an increasing participation. And I do note um, Councillor Barker's um, point on the um, split of responses from um, women versus men and would say that, you know, I'm looking at this thinking that there appears to be on the basis of just responses, it may not be in terms of players, an opportunity here to, to market and increase usage by having um, tournaments or formats that may be, may be more attractive to women. 
or finding out what the barrier is here that is causing the difference for Wahe Takarau. And I'm just so, so my question is, I guess, is is the marketing um, um, component quite separate from the management contract of who's there on the ground? Because that seems to me to, to create an artificial barrier. Um, so through you, I think I think that's a really good question in terms of what what we're trying to achieve with the marketing. And I think there are two different um, two different things that we're trying to achieve. One is around uh, making the, um, the course uh, visitors to the to to the region aware of the course. And I think that that marketing probably does sit with in a in a wider area. But there's also the actually driving use of, within our community of, of the course. And I think that really has to sit in a partnership between council and the golf club. Um, both parties are interested, you know, have interest in driving that. And I think um, in the past there, there has been some, some conflict perhaps between council and, and, the, and the club in terms of the objectives for, for the community. And I think, um, you know, the conversations I've had of, uh, with the club are that those have now been resolved and we can move forward to, to do that. So I think both will, will happen in the future. Thank you. Councillor Barker? Just a small point, but I, I wonder, do you know if the advertising that's done for the course and the publication, uh, publicity of it at the airport, for instance, does it include what the, the fees for playing are? Because they are so cheap. And it's no wonder to me that 80% of the people said they're getting great value. That'll, that will entice a lot of people to play just because it's so comparatively cheap to anywhere else you can play golf. Uh, so I, I don't believe, through, through the chair, I don't believe we do, although I think for visitors to the region, uh, the feedback that we've had is that it's, it's not price that's the driver for visitors, it's actually a different experiences of playing golf. So, you know, I think there's, um, we're just talking to the mayor's point as well. I think there's some opportunity to to look at Nelson as a golfing, the Nelson region as a golfing region, and and do more work with Motueka, um, and some of the other courses that are and Nelson Golf Club, uh, to promote the whole package um, as one rather than just the uh, the individual golf course. Thank you, Mr. Ward. I think we'll. We've had all questions. I don't think there's any more around the table there. We've already received the report. No, you've moved and said you can put that motion. We've received the report as well. No, you've had it moved okay. and seconded, but you didn't put that motion. Okay. So for, for the report, can we put the motion? The report received. No. Sorry, I'm getting too, 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 too conversation. Maybe I or we've Mr. received it. Mr. Chair, I've, you, you moved it and seconded, but you didn't put the motion. No, no. That you received the report. You need to do that now. I've put the motion that we receive the report. Yep. Aye. Those Aye. against? And then we've got the, the decision to be made here, which is the. Sorry, I'm getting. I'll move the second and third Thank you. So we've got here the recommendation is to, to retain the fees, etc. It is. Is there a seconder for that? We've got <coughs> Councillor Barker. Move that. Seconder is Councillor Rutledge. Those in favour? Aye. Those against? Carried. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Levita. So we've got here the, the next agenda item, which is the capital expenditure programme. Request for change. I'll ask you to um, through the chair, so there's no changes to the report. I will take the report as read and am happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Councillor Maston, couldn't miss you there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can I just go to 4.5, Project 3111, the Brook Mountain Bike Hub? <coughs> um, I presume when you say officer resource, you didn't have a staff member that was available to undertake this work. Was that how I read it? Through the chair, that's correct. But we have now? Through the chair, so we will be carrying the, the funding over to next financial year, and this project, all these projects have been scheduled in the, the program of works for next financial year, yes. Okay, well, just to, through you, Mr. Chair, just to carry on, um, I thought there was a bit of urgency surrounding this project um, from the mountain bike and the residents with regard to the hub. 
So through the chair, and uh, I have been um, away overseas, but I caught the end of the annual plan discussions, and I understand that this was discussed at the annual plan, and that there is provision in next financial year for this project to be pursued. It is also um, connected to the application that we made to MB through the Tourism Fund, and I'm, I'm awaiting um, a feedback uh, from MB um, towards the end of June, early July, and then all of those things will be tied up, and it'll be a project that'll be be proceeding next financial year. That's my understanding. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, look, so that's encouraging, but I just want to really press this point and make sure we're very clear. There is staff resource to deliver this project because at the annual plan discussions, it was we were told that there wasn't that wasn't timetabled in. So that's that's changed. We've now got all this the capacity that we need to deliver this in the coming year. Through the chair, if that was, as I said, I did come in through the annual plan late, and rather than give a contrary view to what was given at the annual plan, I will confirm that and get back to um, this council, uh, this committee uh, by the end of today. Thank you. Through you to Mr Libertas. These toilets in the Queen's Gardens are replacing the ones that were under the Souter Art Gallery, is that correct? Um, through the chair, yes. When is it planned to have them complete? Have the, has construction started on the, these? No, through the chair. Um, uh, if you, um, I refer you to um, 3.1. So we um, we went out to tender. There were three non-conforming non tenders received. We are going to have to re-advertise that work, and hopefully that work will well that work will commence in next financial year. So that's why we're asking for that money to be carried over to next financial year. By that stage, we will uh, have secured the tenders, and then work will be able to proceed next financial year. Well, I made an inquiry about this. A number of people raised this with me. With me, the public sort of felt that we should have foreseen the need for these toilets um, early on, uh, and so I sought and and was advised and informed um, several people that um, building would be commencing in June. And uh, that hasn't happened because you haven't been able to find a suitable contractor. Through the chair, that's absolutely correct. So we are seeking, we're going back to market, and we'll be carrying out that money over. So June, June, uh, June commencement date is, is not not on the cards. No. No. So you anticipate it being completed when? Um, through the chair, I can't give you a specific date, but we'll be going out to tender um, in June. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to start um, subject to the, um, the annual plan being approved um, shortly thereafter, but I, I wouldn't be able to give you an exact date, but with, with urgency. Thank you, because I'm disappointed about this. Really, I am. I've gone out, gone back to residents and ratepayers and told them that building would be starting in June, and now you're telling me it's calling tenders in June, so it is a little frustrating. and. Uh, certainly going to be disappointing for the residents. I know it might not be important to some people, but walkers and runners and all those sort of people do stop on there and they just couldn't see the logic why we didn't foresee the need and meet it much earlier on in our planning stages of, the, of this project. Can you answer that? Why why we didn't foresee this and through, through plan the chair. earlier? So, so through the chair, this is a pro. This is this was a project that is in this financial year. It was earmarked to be um, commenced this financial year. We went out to tender. We didn't receive um, a successful tenderer, and we following due process. So I, I guess we we equally disappointed that we're not on the site, but we have to follow process, and the, this is where the process has got us. We haven't been dragging the chain. Um, it's a consequence of um, everything else in the works program. No, it's more about planning. I'm not accusing anyone of dragging the chain. Don't I don't just want to be, just be careful. Um, me, through you, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say that Mr. Mr. Libertas in the planning stages, once the suitor was demolished, uh, that project should have been uh, foreseen. That need should have been foreseen and planned for, and fairly promptly after that, I just would have thought. But just, just so Councillor Courtney, just keep. Can respect there, but the question, there was a statement there, and a question. Well, why of wasn't it foreseen? Because the public are asking me. These are not my words. These are not my words. This is the public saying to me, Mel, why on earth didn't they foresee the need? Once you demolished the suitor, there were toilets under there, well used. Why on earth didn't council foresee this and, and act upon it far quicker than they have? And that's what I'm asking and directing to, to our officer. 
why was it not you know, red flagged? We've got to get on to this I'll immediately. Let, I'll let the Chief Executive answer that. I thought it was partly answered, but I'll get a... Mr Chair, the timing of the Queen's Gardens toilets was a council decision after giving consideration to the Capital Works programme. Um, Mr Lavertis has attempted to implement it in the time frame that it was planned for, and the market has left him unable to do that. Thank you. Madam Mayor. Oh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I've got a few questions, but I must well just say, as we're talking Queen's Gardens toilet upgrade, uh, I do recall this project because it was deemed to be quite a priority by Council. Um, I recall uh, Councillor Noonan being um, um, a person who, who really did say, uh, we went through the previous annual plan, this must be here. Um, so it was included in this financial year. Um, absolutely with the intent that it would be delivered. But what I'm, I'm concerned about is we're now in um, nearly June, right at the end of the financial year, and this is the first reporting back I have seen on this project. Um, I, and now I'm saying I've got a non-conforming tender, and I guess the question I've got is, which aspect is non-conforming? Is it the price? Because if it's the price, I haven't seen anything come through the annual plan process, and maybe maybe I've missed that. Maybe I, maybe there was a request for additional funding, but I don't particularly want to see this then coming back again um, with an unbudgeted expenditure request if we know we would likely to need one now. So if I could just under if I could understand the non-conforming aspect so without without compromising our tendering process. So through the chair, I understand, and I um, as I as I say, I apologise for. Um, um, for being absent, and, and I don't need to apologise there for it, but um, in terms of my no, knowledge gap. No. But I understand from Mr Shane Davies that um, the three tenders that were received had gaps in their submissions. Not It wasn't related to price. Um, that is not to say that when we go back to the market that price may not be an issue, but at this moment in time it was as a result of the submissions in terms of method methodology and a whole range of other things that weren't deemed satisfactory and adequate for us to be able to accept a tender to deliver on the uh, on the outcomes. All right, then. Could I just ask a follow-up question? So, so the tender is due to be let in the next month again? When we're going out for tender again in the next month? So through the chair, we intend to. Um, we are at a stage where we can advertise now. We're asking for this money to be carried over. The annual plan will um, it will tie in with the annual plan being approved, which will enable us to um, place in a better situation to approve the tender. So it, it won't be a, accepted this side of of June. No. All right, but soon after. We like uh, through the chair, yes. Thing. The intention is that we will go uh, an early tender again. Okay as we have done on many of our projects in anticipation of starting this and awarding it um, very soon after the annual plan has been uh, approved. All right, thank you. Um, I've just got some follow-up questions, if I could, Mr Chair, and, and I just would highlight that um, um, it is um, important in terms of uh, the work programme that um, the committee does keep um, updated on, in, on what is there, and, and that's certainly a role that I expect um, you, Mr Chair, to be playing as to watching these track through and updating the committee on um, early in the piece if there's going to be any issues. Now, the um, just coming to the Turnery Reserve um, Fund, well done, budget saving, that's fantastic, and the same um, just in terms of the reserves development. I fully understand what you were saying in terms of 4.3 with the Rutherford Park play space, that makes sense to me. And then I come to the Marsden Valley mountain bike track stage one, and I just want to understand, uh, you tell us the project was on hold until December 2016, and could you just remind us please, Mr Lavertis, through the chair, um, why it was on hold, Do you, if, you, if you know. Um, through the chair, I can't specifically advise why it was on hold until December 2016, but I do know uh, from my memory that this was to do with the, the Trails Trust and in connection with figuring out the grade of the track, which was slightly different to what was in the annual plan, and we were working with them to figure out the, um, the, the correct grade, the grade of the track from memory. So, so the, the delay here is and to, to get a better outcome, is that essentially what we've got? So have we got agreement about where this track's going to go? 
um, um, th through the chair. So uh, to answer your first question, yes, it's about better outcomes. I think we understand exactly where it's going, but we need to ascertain what the grade is. And I oh, think that those discussions are um, being uh, well held and I have are, are, are fruitful. And, and Mr. Levitas, is that with the, uh, is that going to ch change the consent or being able to go ahead of that with a change potential change of the grade? Is that going to so through the chair? No, I don't think so. And I just want to r remind you through the chair that this is different. This is the Marsden Valley. Okay. It's, it's not not the other issues that we've been dealing with. This is uh, this isn't a different location. No, I realise. I realise. I realise yes. that. But just just playing. I understand that there's that no there's no issues. And that's not necessarily on our part, but I'm getting Correct. that partnership. Yes. Going. No, and Mr. Chair, you understand my line of questioning is, is um, I, I do want it absolutely locked down in writing that everybody's in agreement. I don't really want to be having an, another one of these conversations where um, everyone said yes and then everybody says no a week after a consent's been granted. So no, no, what's that <laughs> reason? I, through the Chair, um, agree 100%. Right, thank you. And then, just, Mr. Chair, just have, and then I'm complete. Just in terms of the last issue, um, that relates to the Brook Mountain Bike Hub, and I'm just um, reading this. And I just want to make sure we've got this right, because obviously I've got an annual plan that I need to bring back to you in December, that this now aligns with the deliberations process that we've gone through, where we have um, provided some additional money. Um, some, Mr. Lewis, the context being we've provided some additional money for this project, and we've made some decisions that we'll see some other track development being undertaken by the Mountain Biking Club in an effort to free up some staff time so this one can get on and be delivered. So I just want to make sure that I've understood the context for this. And does that sound about right? Absolutely, that's is? the correct context. Excellent. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Councillor Rutledge. Uh, th thank you. Just to follow up on 4.4, the Marsden Valley, do, do we actually have a time frame for that project now? Um, through the chair, um, we probably do, but I'm unable to tell you what the time frame is. Um, I can in the same time that I report back as to whether we can, whether we will deliver um, 4.5, I undertook to get back to you on that one, I will okay. answer that same question. I'll Thank answer you. that additional question for you at the same time. Thank you. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, it's uh, it's really, really pleasing. You don't often see it. We've got three items here. Turner Reserve Development Fund, the Project 1063 Reserve Development, and particularly the Rutherford Play Space coming back with under expenditure, and it's it's great to see whose back do we pat for achieving this, and can, can we get this whatever it is, and to uh, to apply whatever it was applied to achieve these outcomes, which are really good. Can you tell me what where were the savings made in these particular projects? Was it is there, was there a common factor? Through the chair, I think it's a combination of things. I think we delivered what we were meant to um, within the budget, and it just happened to be um, um, as, a, as a result of a saving. I do point out that these projects are very, very different to the physical works that these that, that we undertake. This is more to do with uh, replacing shade sails, um, landscaping, and are very, very different to us digging in the ground. So, so I just make that point. Thank you. L long may it continue, Mr. Chairman, that we achieve this sort of outcome. Not very good. Well, before I, um, there's no more questions. Just, uh, <coughs> Mr. Libertas, back to the toilets. It's an, it's not an upgrade, is it? It's a rebuild of the Queen's Gardens toilets, isn't it? Through the chair, yes, it's a total upgrade. It's a, it's a new building. Before I move into receiving this report or, or putting the motion on the table, I see we've got four here. Um, I'd like to see them all done at the same time, but is there any, around the table, is there any desire to have them done separately? Councillor Rutledge? Um, I'm just wondering if we can get some answers to some of these timing questions that we've requested prior to um, being actually making a decision, because I think those those answers are material. Yeah, so Councillor Rutledge, I was a wee bit confused there, so you're, with timing, which I thought we'd covered, but is some particular, is there a particular one of the particular recommendations here, projects here? No, no, no. Mr. Lavers has just said that he's going to um, come back to us on um, two pieces of, of timing and, and capacity questions with 4.4 and 4.5. So, 
So, so through the chair, yes, I will. I don't believe they are um, fundamental to the decisions being m taken today because all we're asking is for that money to be taken over. How we develop those are questions um, uh, for next financial year. So I, I don't think that those questions and my answers are going to be fundamental to, to these decisions. Um, d if I may, they are for me because what they speak to is being assured that we have the capacity to deliver these projects next year and, and we're not then going to be having this conversation again further down the track. Through the chair, I, I, I offer that I can get those answers to you by the end of the week. This has, this has to go to council. Correct. So this and is going to I will have those answers um, in, uh, at a, in a timely fashion that council councillors will be able to make that decision at council. Okay, so Councillor Rutledge, we've got that going to full full committee. So when is full next full council? It's So, Mr. Councillor Rutledge, does that satisfy sure. your concern? Thank you. So, so back to my original question, we've got the four four recommendations here. I'd be happy to get those moved, but have you got a question, Madam Mayor? Uh, well, actually, I'd, I actually would appreciate a... I support, actually, the, the, the direction that Councillor Rutledge is um, attempting to get to, and... I understand fully why he's doing this, and I and I um, also understand that Mr. Lavudas can't just turn something around for us in the next hour necessarily. I would, but I think what is important is that when matters come up from committees, they come up with the full story. And I'm just wondering if we could get a brief adjournment because I'd like to add an additional clause here, and I just want a bit of time to work on the wording, that will signal to council that this committee is only moving m money forward rather than um, relinquishing it. Because remember that every time you do this, there's, this is more rates that have to be collected. And we should only be collecting them if we're going to um, deliver the project. So I just want to see if we can come up with a clause here that would signal the intent of the committee that you're moving it forward, these matters are going forward, but your expectation is that they will be delivered in the next financial year. And I understand the office is a uh, indicating that will happen, but I would just appreciate an adjournment to get some wording that is um, suitably respectful of the advice, but also suitably directive of the committee. If, with your leave, Mr Chair. Um, yes, I understand that. The officers have said not projects completed, not needed, that's fine, but there are some here that um, um, we've heard several members of the committee, committee speak on quite strongly this morning about the community's expectations. Is that all right? Just won't take me very long. I might want to have a cup of tea and then I could. Uh, I think we'll be able to craft them all together, but we'll see how we go. Thank you.
Thank everybody. We'll take take our seats. We'll get back into Councillor Courtney, Councillor Barker. Thank you. So returning back to to the council meeting here, we have a we just have a brief adjournment for a rewording. Madam, Madam Mayor, would you like to to read out what you've? Oh, I could, but I've given it to you, and right. I think EJ's got it, so EJ's all set to go. I'll read while, while we're just waiting to come up on the screen. There's just been so you've got something to uh, mull, mull over, mull over briefly. Um, uh, Madam Mayor has added the notes that updated officer advice on resourcing, timing, and funding of projects will be confirmed at the council meeting at which this recommendation is considered. That's below the four approvals, and we're happy to run. And as we indicated before. Everyone happy that we run those all as one, one recommendation? So we haven't we, we haven't received. Mr Chair, if I could just, just by way of explanation, what I'm trying to do here is send a signal from the committee to council so that when council receives us, so they'll see the recommendations from the committee yep. and they will know to expect that there's yep. going to be some update. Otherwise what I think will happen is that Mr Lavertis will receive multiple emails from councillors with questions yep. about different projects. They will then know that they're going to get that advice when it comes through. Well, Madam Mayor, would you care to receive the report and the recommendation that we have up on the screen? I'd prefer not to since it's going to council. It's very, as okay. you know, it's very rare for me to okay. do a recommendation to council. I'll, I'll move that. Yep, thank you. Yep, good point. Yep, understood. Rather than predetermining. Um, so we've got that Councillor Rutledge brought that. We need a seconder. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Barker. There's no debate. So is there any debate, discussion on that? Those in favour? Those against? Carried. <coughs> so that, I believe, is in what we require in the public portion. So that concludes business in the public agenda. We're now going to move into public excluded. Recommendation is outlined in the agenda. Can I have someone move that we go into public excluded? Moved by Councillor Courtney, seconded by Councillor Fulton. I put into the motion that we move into, or was there any debate on that? I move that we, oh thank you, thank you Josephine. I'll put that the motion we have is to move into public excluded as outlined in the agenda. I suppose those in favour, those against, carried and once again thank you for Josephine Ripley for attending. <coughs> 